I'm going to try over the course of this video to convince you that Star Trek Discovery is good. Not a joke. Not being sarcastic. I'm going to do it. Because I think I have a pretty good argument and I'm interested to see if it holds water with you. Now, if you're like me, and I can't imagine you're not, you think of Star Trek in two distinct eras. There's classic Trek, meaning everything from the original series in the 60s to Star Trek Enterprise in the early aughts. Uh, this was Star Trek on primetime network television. Wednesdays at 9, 8 central on UPN. And then there's modern Star Trek. This is the stuff that's gone straight to Paramount Plus, or CBS All Access before that got rebranded. This is a sort of postmodern Star Trek, a Star Trek that's questioning what it means to be Star Trek, a Star Trek that trades on familiar symbols and icons, recontextualizing them and repurposing them for more complex, darker narratives. And, well, <sighs> I'm more a fan of the former than I am of the latter, but I'm admitting defeat. I've given up fighting it. This video is about how I stopped hating modern Star Trek shows and why I think they're not bad and, well, why a lot of the criticism surrounding them is off base. This comes from a former hater, so please be gentle. Let's start with this. 1. Classic Trek Before we talk about where we are, let's set the stage with where we began. Star Trek is a remarkable and hearty little franchise. In the midst of one of the most turbulent decades in American history, with the civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, the assassinations of multiple political leaders, with the Cold War forcing Americans to imagine the all-too-real possibility that they may die in a nuclear apocalypse that could render the entire planet uninhabitable, Star Trek came along and said, things are gonna get better. Here in 2022, it's not that difficult to imagine the anxieties that folks in the 60s must have been feeling. The world was just moving too fast. Computers were becoming more commonplace. Satellites were going into orbit. We were traveling to space. We were on our way to the moon. Information was moving faster than ever, with images of the war in Vietnam coming straight into living rooms in real time, and societal changes were causing cataclysmic rifts in American society fueling political extremism and cultural radicalization. And in that context, Star Trek promised that humanity would persevere. We would learn. We would grow. Our most hated enemies would become our friends. We would set aside our differences. We would explore the frontiers of space, not as colonizers or conquerors, but as explorers on grand machines that we had devised for the noblest of reasons, staffed not by soldiers and warriors, but by scientists, diplomats, and scholars. When I don't feel great about the way things are going, I take refuge in this show. As much as I love Star Wars and superheroes and Disney and musicals and the Muppets, there's nothing that calms me down and centers me like an hour aboard a Starfleet vessel. I know that it's often cheesy and silly, and that these shows can be pretty formulaic and corny, but that's part of the joy. Through the years, Star Trek retained this ideology, promising that tomorrow would be brighter than today. In the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and into the 21st century, Star Trek reflected the fears of that era and promised that humanity would overcome. My very first Star Trek show was Star Trek Enterprise. It was my introduction to the franchise, and in the midst of the post-9-11 Bush years, uh, with the war on terror in full swing, Star Trek again promised brighter futures. Until... 2. A change has occurred. In the third season of Star Trek Enterprise, the planet Earth suffers a devastating terrorist attack. 
millions are killed, and the alien race behind the attack, the Zindi, are completely unknown to us. They live in a dangerous and unexplored patch of space called the Delphic Expanse, and the planet Earth's sole ship, the Enterprise, must travel through it in search of those who perpetrated the attack. After two seasons of discovering the galaxy, the Enterprise was now no longer a ship of exploration, it was a ship of justice. While the ships of Star Trek had typically been staffed by scientists and engineers and philosopher captains, this Enterprise was now crewed by a team of MAKOs, short for Military Assault Command Operations. These were soldiers, ready to fight, armed with weapons. The spirit of the show changed from one of joy to, well... Terror isn't quite the right word, it was still a fun show to watch, and there were still standalone episodes about the Enterprise visiting an Old West town, and about members of the crew traveling back in time to 2004 Detroit, but something had changed, and innocence was lost. Captain Jonathan Archer, who had previously commanded the Enterprise with a boyish enthusiasm, known for his optimistic grin, his baseball cap, and his pet dog, was now world-weary and compromised. When the Enterprise is severely damaged and needs a new warp core, a small ship finds them and offers to help. They're willing to repair the Enterprise, but they're not willing to give Archer their warp core, so... He takes it. By force. He reasons that without their warp core, he'll never save the planet Earth from an imminent terrorist attack, and so he just steals it. Uh, even though he has no right to it, he decides he needs it, and he takes it. There's probably a much longer video to be made about how Star Trek Enterprise dramatized America's loss of innocence in the wake of September 11th, but... It felt here like Star Trek had left something behind. This was not how a Starfleet officer behaved. This was not the type of mission that a ship named Enterprise was supposed to go on. In the show's fourth and final season, under a new showrunner, they jettisoned almost all of this dark material and basically devoted that season to being a fan service parade. You got a storyline about Khan's augmented superhumans, uh, another one about the Mirror Universe. You got appearances by Orion Slave Girls, a Gorn, classic era Star Trek ships, and even Riker and Troy showed up. At the time, it felt corny, but now it almost feels like a victory lap. It was the end of an era, and it felt like it was time to celebrate. And so in 2004, Star Trek left the airwaves permanently. 3. Star Trek's Rebirth I remember very vividly when the first teaser trailer for Star Trek Discovery was released. It was very simple, just a shot of a ship leaving space dock, but I must have watched that trailer 40 or 50 times. I was obsessed with it. I loved this ship. They had taken a long-forgotten study model that Ralph McQuarrie had designed as a proposed Enterprise for use in the first Star Trek movie, and they had updated it adding all kinds of cool nods to the pre-original series era that this series was supposed to take place in. I remember talking with my friends about whether or not the show would depict the Federation Klingon War, or maybe the series would be set during the Earth-Romulan War of the 22nd century. Uh, would we see the early days of the Federation? Would we see the missing link between Captain Archer's speech in the last episode of Star Trek Enterprise and the universe as we met it in Star Trek the original series? Hmm. The answer was no. Oh no. Oh no 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 no. Well, first of all, Star Trek Discovery had absolutely zero interest in canon. The Klingons had four nostrils, claws, and didn't act like Klingons. They didn't dress like Klingons, their ships weren't Klingon ships. 
and on board the Discovery, everything was wrong. The uniforms were wrong, the technology was wrong, the set design, the way people were talking and acting. I remember reading some very persuasive arguments during this time that maybe the entire show was taking place in the Mirror Universe, and that was why everything was so wrong. <sighs> But no, that was just what Star Trek looked like now. But more than the show's visuals, something was off about the storytelling. In all of its incarnations, Star Trek has always been a pretty formulaic show. It was so regular you could set your watch by it. Literally, Star Trek used to work on a definite act system, with each act ending on a cliffhanger that would lead to a commercial break. Classic Star Trek from the 60s had four acts per episode. The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager each used a five-act structure, and Enterprise returned to a four-act structure. There were exceptions, like when the extra-long Voyager episode, Flesh and Blood, used a seven-act structure, but... For the most part, the pacing of an episode was governed by the number and frequency of commercial breaks, and this meant that, at regular intervals, the episodes would have climactic moments of crisis that would push their stories forward. Even Seth MacFarlane's Star Trek-esque show The Orville uses a similar six-act structure. But when Star Trek moved to the commercial-free world of streaming, well, all bets were off. Episode runtimes fluctuated, episodes began to meander from scene to scene, taking their good sweet time building momentum, and often the episodes would end without a resolution, with the events of that week's story merely being prelude to next week's adventures. It was almost like, rather than each episode having smaller narrative acts, the season was the narrative, and each episode was serving as an act. And... Those season-long stories? Well, they weren't great. There's an old story about William Shatner, which may or may not be true, that he adopted his characteristic halting speech pattern after he had been cast in a play that wasn't terribly good. The trouble was that by the time his character appeared late into the play, the audiences had already begun to leave, and so he started talking in a way that made it seem like the thing he was about to say was going to be so exciting that if you just hang on, the really good stuff was coming next. This is how it felt watching Star Trek Discovery. Clues were being assembled, enigmatic phrases and coded terms were scattered about. It was borderline impossible to follow, and if you did manage to understand it, it didn't make much sense. The season-long narratives felt like somebody was just making things up as they were going along, and then ran out of time as the season ended, so things ended abrupt Four. Um, so this was supposed to be a positive video about... Star Trek Discovery, so you maybe you maybe want it you want to do that now, please? Okay. So very recently I had the chance to go back and rewatch Star Trek Discovery, and it's not that bad. It isn't. A lot of the dark and violent moments, well, they're almost so over the top that they're kind of campy and ridiculous. There's a moment in Season 2 where a Klingon woman takes the decapitated head of a newborn baby out of a basket and holds it aloft like a baseball to a cheering crowd. When I first watched that scene, I was horrified at the depravity of modern Star Trek. But now? It's so goofy and over the top, I can't take that nonsense seriously. When Mr. Spock was introduced as a violent, psychotic man who was proficient in martial arts, well, I didn't lament the destruction of this character who very famously disarmed his opponents non-violently. And when the planet Vulcan was renamed Nivar, I, well, okay, I actually still hate that one, but my point is this. 
a lot of the shock that I experienced while watching the show for the first time wore off, and I noticed some stuff that I hadn't originally, and that made me, well, if not a fan of Discovery, certainly more understanding of its core mission. And that is this. Star Trek Discovery doesn't hate classic Star Trek. It doesn't. But it also doesn't revere it. In 2004, when Captain Archer encountered a CGI Gorn, great care was taken to ensure that this Gorn didn't appear too different to its 1960s predecessor. In Discovery? Well, they redesigned the Klingons, the Ferengi, the Andorians, even the original Enterprise, just, well, just because. Characters like Spock, Sarek, Pike, Harry Mudd, they all got radical redesigns as well. Spock now had a previously unmentioned adopted human sister. Harry Mudd was a violent psychopath. But these changes weren't made out of disrespect. The folks creating the show aren't fixing canon, they're making it their own. In their minds, Star Trek doesn't belong to its past. It belongs to whoever is currently telling the story. If you want to take the most sacrosanct elements of the past and radically reinvent them, you can. The future can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't matter what's come before. There is nothing that can limit us. And that is the point of modern Star Trek. 5. The Radical Future the original series of Star Trek took a look at the world around it and said, no, things can be radically different. The old tribal factions of race and nationality and religion are going to be stripped away and we're going to move into a future that's so beyond what we're capable of today that it's going to seem almost impossible, but we'll get there. But over time... As Star Trek became a franchise that extended over 700 episodes and 10 movies, well, that world of Star Trek stopped being radical. It became familiar. It became home. It was a source of comfort and joy, but it was also limiting. The world of Star Trek was no longer a place where anything was possible, it was a place where the present was beholden to the past, where the stories we were able to tell today were dependent on the stories that had already been told before. A Starfleet ship must obey certain design precepts set forth on high several decades ago. The events of this timeline are established and untouchable. The uniforms, the set design, the technology, the tone, all were decided upon by those who came before. Even the structures of episodes were rigidly defined. For lo, each act must conclude with a cliffhanger and thus entice viewers to return from their commercial breaks. Here's the big revelation that I had while watching Discovery for the second time. The future doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. We're not going to be there. We may want for our values, our way of life to persevere, for the generations after us to experience things the way that we want them to, but we really don't get a say. It's their lives. It's their society. They can do with it whatever they want to do. Much like the 1960s, I look at the world of today and I see a planet that's in the midst of enormous change. The world today doesn't look like the world of 10 years ago, and the world of tomorrow? Who knows what parts of our lives today that we take for granted will be changed or will disappear entirely. The future is going to be radically different from the present, and that's scary. We want certainty. We want things to be the way they've always been, but that's not what Star Trek is about. Modern Star Trek makes me uncomfortable. It takes things that I love, immutable facets of canon, and futzes around with them. I don't like that. But where does that feeling come from? 
Well, I think it comes from the same place that Star Trek has been trying to fight against for its entire existence. From the place that says that our future ambitions should be limited by our present understanding, by our present values, by our present worldview. And I'll close with this. One of the most widely ridiculed moments in Star Wars The Last Jedi was when Kylo Ren said, Let the past die. Kill it if you have to. That's the only way to become what you are meant to be. This felt hollow and dumb, and it was, because it was half-assed, and because the Star Wars franchise wasn't really interested in killing the past, it reveled in it, and because Star Wars as a story was always about legacies and lineages and histories. But Star Trek? Yeah. That's what it's all about. Let the past die. The hatred of the Jim Crow era, the fear of the Cold War, the racism and bigotry. Let it die. Kill it if you have to. That's the only way to become what you were meant to be. What are the sacred parts of our world today that we can't imagine being without, but that we will have to abandon to reach a brighter future? And what's it going to feel like to give those up? Is it going to feel like watching Star Trek Discovery? Uncomfortable? Painful? Agitating? There is a lot more to talk about with Star Trek Discovery, but I can't believe that this video went on for this long. Uh, this whole YouTube thing is still new to me, and it turns out that these topics can kind of get away from you if you're not careful. <laughs> but if you want to see me talk about ALF or the Brady Bunch or the sitcom community or Pixar or any number of completely random pop culture topics, those videos are on my channel now. Uh, please consider subscribing. I'm a new YouTuber, and we're inching closer to 400 subscribers, which is insanely cool. I want to thank all of you for watching this video, and I hope I'll see you next time where we'll give a similar amount of thoughtful analysis to something equally silly. I hope to see you then. Bye!